African elephants are incredible creatures, and they possess countless qualities that make them so lovable. I always loved seeing elephants at the zoo when I was a little kid. They're cute. Elephants are awesome. I love that they nurture and care. I think the major characteristic of elephants uh, is the maternal aspect of, of that species. Uh, if you watch elephants for any length of time, uh, the females are just incredibly, uh, they're such incredible mothers. And so there's a, in the herd, there's the mother of the calf, and then all the aunties uh, that are members of the group that actually help raise that calf also. Uh, so it's, if you look at it from that aspect, they're, they're quite, uh, you can understand why uh, people give, uh, associate elephants with human qualities because there is a lot of that. They're just exceptional mothers. In drought situations, they remember and know where I can always go and they will take the herd to a very a long place away and they will be able to know where that's at. However, despite the many reasons to love the African elephant, the species is nonetheless suffering substantially from ivory poaching. When an elephant is poached for its ivory, the animal is poisoned and trapped in a snare or shot with arrows, machine guns, or rocket-powered grenade launchers from the ground or helicopters before the poacher mauls the elephant's face, extracting its ivory all the way up into the head of the elephant and killing the elephant. The act of ivory poaching kills the elephant, kills it. Nowadays, many species are facing extinction. However, putting an end to ivory poaching and promoting elephant conservation deserves special attention for the sake of animals and people across the globe. Elephants are a, a, a great umbrella species for you to utilize to protect A, habitat, and B, other species that share the same habitat uh, with elephants. Elephants do open up habitat for other species to live and to eat, and so if you take them out of that, that niche, um, you would be causing some huge problems. Uh, there were areas of the um, Africa that would overgrow and make it very, very difficult for the animals that are smaller that eat uh, pasture grass and stuff like that. So, and we firmly believe that we can actually help save cultures and, and save uh, these different cultures' way of life by keeping elephants in the field. Uh, let's face it, uh, there are thousands upon thousands of people that go to Africa every year just to take photos of elephants. Uh, and when they do that, they're putting money in the field, they're, they're actually giving uh, uh, communities uh, money to protect their way of life, uh, and it, it really helps. Ivory poaching has posed a threat to elephants for decades now, but as time proceeds, ivory poaching is adapting. In 1977, Kenya and Africa um, were in the throes of an ivory poaching crisis um, that saw populations of elephants being wiped out across the continent. We were amidst, you know, a worldwide poaching problem. Um, in, 19, in the late 1980s, when an international ban um, on the sale of ivory came into effect, um, poaching actually substantially decreased across the continent and, and poaching incidences were much, much, much fewer. Now we're, we're in a situation that we have today because obviously there were two one-off ivory sales um, you know, to China and Japan and, and that sort of led to the increase in demand of ivory and obviously which has led to an escalation in ivory poaching that we see today. So in the 1970s we were in the middle of an ivory poaching crisis and now we find ourselves in, in an ivory poaching crisis again. Causing concern for conservationists for African elephants. Probably the largest one uh, today is poaching. Uh, we're, we're losing around 96 elephants a day uh, to poaching, and that's Africans and Asians. Um, but uh, uh, African elephants are poached uh, both sexes because both sexes have tusks. That when they take a female, and especially an older female, out of a herd, 
it's very problematic because you're losing the tribal knowledge that that animal has. Uh, but you also take the number of young that that female would produce throughout her lifetime. You're taking all those animals out of the population. Uh, there's around 600,000 African elephants. Uh, so the population of African elephants is higher than Asians. Uh, but the pressure is much, much uh, harder. So with poaching, uh, elephants are a long-lived species. However, they reproduce very slowly. They have a 22-month gestation. So they only reproduce and put another calf on the ground every four to six, four to six years. So it's very problematic when animals are taken out of that population. It, it is very, very destructive uh, to the population. The situation is, is different. Um, technology has changed. Um, there are now instances of poaching, not so much in Kenya, but across Africa, that's been reported of, of, of you know helicopters being flown in to ship out ivory or, or to hunt elephants. You know, there's, there's AK-47 being used, um, the snares being used, poison arrows are being used. So um, the ways in which to poach elephants are, are diverse. In an effort to protect the African elephant from poaching, various organizations are working to prevent ivory poaching. As I said before, uh, both at the San Diego Zoo and at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, we have uh, large elephant collections. And, and we fund uh, research and conservation worldwide. Uh, we always look for conservation partners uh, because number one, uh, the more conservation partners you have, uh, you can draw them in and utilize uh, both their expertise and, and you can match their expertise to yours and funding also. So you can, do, you can accomplish much, much more with partners. So uh, we partner with many different conservation organizations, one of which is the International Elephant Foundation. And so we help fund International Elephant Foundation and, and we do grants for field conservationists to deal with many, many different issues. We have put collars on elephants uh, for years now, and it does allow us to track, track elephants. Uh, there are some concerns. Uh, uh, poachers are always looking at new ways of becoming more prolific. Uh, there is a lot of concern over collars uh, that if, in fact, poachers find the same uh, 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 frequency that you're operating on, the, the collar could leave a po lead a poacher directly to the animal. Um, so we, we guard those frequencies uh, very, very well, and to date we haven't had a problem. But uh, it really allows us to track the animals and to prove or disprove uh, how much elephant-human conflict we are having. We assist in training conservation officers in Africa. We have training programs to help them understand, you know, our investigative techniques and stuff. Kenya has made a significant number of enforcement efforts with regard to combat wildlife crime, including the following. Active security operations to hunt down poachers informed by wildlife movement and distribution and through the deployment of interagency anti-poaching units in areas considered poaching hotspots. The deployment of sniffer dogs to major exit points, including air and sea ports, to detect illegal trafficking of ivory. Enhancement of surveillance and detection through use of scanners to detect wildlife contraband. Collaboration with other agencies, such as the police, Musaka Agreement Task Force as well as county governments and cross-border collaboration, strengthening prosecution of wildlife offenses, census, ear notching, and fitting of transmitters and transponders to enhance monitoring, translocation of vulnerable wildlife populations to appropriate areas including intensive protection zones (IPZs) and fenced sanctuaries, Enhancing security through creating synergies between government and private actors. For example, training scouts from private sanctuaries at Kenya Wildlife Service and undertaking joint security operations. And exploring the use of new technologies including camera traps, drones, 
infrared sensor techniques, and thermal images. We have nine anti-poaching teams that work, um, eight of them work throughout um, the Greater Savo Conservation Area, and our brand new anti-poaching team is actually um, a fully mobile anti-poaching team. So if there's any issue throughout Kenya, um, re poaching related that needs addressing, be it bushmeat poaching or, or ivory poaching, that team's ready to be on the move um, whenever it's called up, you know, to address those problems. Um, we've got aerial surveillance, we've got four aircraft and one helicopter, and their role is, is to support our anti poaching team up in the air. So, obviously, our anti poaching teams work on the ground and they're supported by our pilots in the air. Um, and that means we can react really quickly to any instances of poaching because obviously aircraft can cover a much a, a vast distance, a much faster distance than our anti-poaching teams could on the ground. Um, we've got four mobile vet units, so they work throughout Kenya, so they're ready to provide rapid aid to any injured animal. Um, one of our projects we're most well known for is, is the Orphans Project, um, and that's when we rescue, hand rear, and then reintegrate orphans, elephants, and rhinos back back into the world um, and obviously as poaching, um, ivory poaching has escalated over the years so it's a number of orphans that we're called to rescue so in the last 10 years um, we've actually seen a 500% increase in the number of orphans we've been called to rescue as a result of poaching so that, that sort of, you know, the orphans project is, is really key therefore to keeping elephant populations alive and keeping, you know, the next generation alive with elephants and um, to keep, to give the species a future. Despite numerous efforts to put an end to ivory poaching though, the ivory market, a product of ivory poaching, runs rampant on an international scale. The largest ivory market perpetuating the demand for poaching is China, where ivory has deep historical ties to luxury and status in Chinese culture. However, as if killing thousands of elephants annually isn't reason enough to put an end to ivory poaching, Millions of dollars of profit from ivory poaching funds African terrorist organizations including Al-Shabaab, the LRA, and Boko Haram. The international market for ivory should not overshadow the American market for ivory. The United States is the second largest ivory market in the world. And right now the biggest trade with elephants is obviously the ivory it has a huge value. And part of that has to do with the fact that uh, um, with of uh, an increased economic status in China, you have people with more money who can now afford to buy these very valuable carvings from the elephant. Um, I can see why people want them because they are beautiful, but the difference is that you can get a carving that looks just as beautiful made out of a different composite and most people can't tell. Our inspectors and agents who are trained and some of the biologists could look at it and tell if it's real ivory or not. It comes down to um, the desire to have it as more of a status to say this is real ivory. Ivory has been highly valued in China as a luxury good since antiquity and different sources of ivory were used – mammoth, elephant, walrus, and narwhal. There is substantial evidence that elephants were once present in some parts of China and as early as the Shang and Zhao dynasties, elephant tusks were carved. Later, when elephants were scarce in China, ivory was also imported. Ivory was grouped with and regarded as highly as other culturally favored materials, such as jade, bronze, and gold. It was used in both secular and Buddhist contexts, and was fashioned into everything from jewelry to sculptures. It was a relatively rare and expensive material, which also added to its status as a coveted good. In the Yuan Dynasty, an imperial bureau regulated and approved the quality of ivory carvings for the palace. In subsequent dynasties, the ivory made for the imperial court continued to be assigned to palace bureaus with top-level craftsmen. Ivory was probably more widely abundant in the late imperial period of the late Ming and Qing dynasty, and at this time more people would have had a chance to acquire ivory objects. In the late Ming and in the Qing, trade developed with Europeans collecting ivory decorations carved in China. Nowadays, China has around 150 legal, government-licensed ivory shops. They are the only places allowed to sell ivory to individual buyers. The government says ivory carving is an ancient art it wants to keep alive. Chinese consumers, increasingly wealthy, desire ivory. Some think it is lucky, while for some it is a way to display their status. Others see it as a good investment 
and may give ivory as a gift or bribe to win favor with an official or business contact. It is certainly good business. It, the shops, is a common scam. Reusing old IDs to sell new pieces of ivory can be a way of laundering ivory that is not from the legal stockpile, but illegal, smuggled into China. It's hard for the average person to really understand the background behind something that they're buying because it, it's even hard for an agent. I mean, you say illegal ivory. There's a lot of ivory that's in the United States that's been here for a long time, that was brought here before it became illegal to bring it to the United States. So when you say illegal ivory, if you can't tell the age of it, you can't necessarily tell if it's illegal. Or even if it came in after the ban, it might have come in through a legal mechanism, maybe through trophy hunting, but then it can't be sold if it was brought through as a trophy. It can be sold as an ivory carving. So it gets much more complicated, and, that, and that's why enforcement of the law the way it's written is very, very difficult. So here it's like, I don't want it, I don't need it, but can I make money off of it? And once again, they've thrown out the concept that, gee, if I sell this, even if I didn't kill it, even if I don't want it, even if I don't wear it, they forget that if they sell it, they're still promoting the trade. They're still promoting the concept that people can get these items and somebody else might look at it and say, well, you're asking too much for one that was legally imported years ago, but if I can go and get an illegal one, it's going to cost less. So I'll go buy one of those and it's still promoting the trade. However, the consequences of a perpetuated ivory market, primarily by nations such as China and the U.S., extend beyond animal conservation. The profits from the ivory market are taken advantage of by terrorist organizations such as Al-Shabaab, the LRA, and Boko Haram. The International Conservation Caucus published an article that said, quote, poaching is financing terrorist and violent organizations, and increasingly brutal poaching operations are creating war zones between poachers and park rangers, end quote. The National Counterterrorism Center describes Al-Shabaab as the militant wing of the Somali Council of Islamic Courts and places it in Mogadishu as well as northern and central Somalia. In 2008, Al-Shabaab was declared a foreign terrorist organization and it was declared a specially designated global terrorist. The National Counterterrorism Center writes, quote, Al-Shabaab is responsible for the assassination of Somali peace activists, international aid workers, numerous civil society figures, and journalists, and for blocking the delivery of aid from Western relief agencies during the 2011 famine that killed tens of thousands of Somalis." Al-Shabaab is also responsible for the attack on a Westgate shopping mall in Kenya on September 21, 2013, which resulted in 67 deaths. A Washington Time article mentioned that Al-Shabaab uses part of its profits from ivory to pay the salary of 5,000 employees. The Washington Post published an article that stated 40% of Al-Shabaab's funding comes from the profits from the ivory trade and the Huffington Post published an article that stated Al-Shabaab profits roughly $600,000 monthly from the ivory trade. The LRA was established in 1988 and since then has had fluctuating presences in both Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The LRA has a reputation of murder, torture, rape, mutilation, and the abduction of child sex slaves and soldiers. The LRA uses ivory trafficking profits to purchase food, weapons, and ammunition. In West Africa, Boko Haram is a Nigerian terrorist group. The CNN article, Boko Haram, A Bloody Insurgency, A Growing Challenge, writes, quote, The militant group has bombed schools, churches, and mosques, kidnapped women and children, and assassinated politicians and religious leaders alike." End quote. Also, according to the National Counterterrorism Center, 
Boko Haram detonated its first vehicle IED in 2011, and in July of 2013, Boko Haram took a French hostage, extending its activity to foreign countries. In mid-April 2014, Boko Haram kidnapped 300 schoolgirls. Boko Haram also benefits from the profits of ivory poaching. The critical nature of the current ivory market has not gone unnoticed, and just as various organizations are working to end ivory poaching, various organizations are also working to end the ivory trade. I'm a special agent for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So I spent 20 years as a criminal investigator in investigating things like international trade in illegal wildlife, post-wildlife, and wildlife products. So when you use the term wildlife, it refers to not only live, animals in the trade, but the products that come from those animals when they're, when they're taken, when they're killed. So that would include not just tusks from elephants, but fur skin, anything on an elephant. It could be the meat, it could be skins used to build, make products, whatever there might be. We are also uh, working with many, uh, uh, many different organizations to try and stop the flow of ivory from Africa into these different Asian uh, countries uh, that are the biggest users of, of, of uh, both animal artifacts and elephant ivory. One of the things that we are involved with right now, however, locally rather than uh, uh, in, abroad in Africa, uh, is that we are trying uh, to uh, get the state of California not to allow the sale of ivory in the in this state. Uh, we have worked very very hard with other states also to try and get a ban on the ivory sales uh, in this country. Uh, the state of California is the third highest user and seller of ivory out of the 50 states. So, uh, so we think if we can get that through, uh, we can uh, we can stop that. And if we're the third highest, think about what that would do for ivory coming into the states. Congress, too, has taken action against ivory poaching in two major acts. The African Elephant Conservation Act of 1988 and the Endangered Species Act. The African Elephant Conservation Act, which was passed by Congress in 1988, was an effort to reduce the amount of elephants being killed for their ivory. Specifically, the law established an African Elephant Conservation Fund to support research, conservation, and the protection of African elephants. The bill also established a moratorium on ivory imports from countries that don't meet international tracking standards and established criminal penalties for individuals who illegally import or export ivory. The ivory trade in the United States is further restricted by the Endangered Species Act, international agreements, and executive orders. However, the issue of ivory poaching is still on Congress's plate. I mean, I think it, it, enforcement is obviously important because you, I don't, I don't think enforcement is ever going to stop illegal trade because demand is always there, but enforcement certainly will slow it down and make changes and, and make, some people might decide not to do an illegal activity because of fear of being caught. There will always be somebody who will go ahead and do it because they don't care. And the profit is worth it for them to try. It's educating people as to what they need to survive. And we're dealing more with the, the other end of it, the buyers in the United States who might be buying illegal ivory or hunters who might be going over there on a legal hunt but then importing the stuff illegally because they know they can make money off of it here. So we would be involved on, on the import end once it comes into the United States. We had um, a Nigerian group that was smuggling ivory in, I want to say it was 2004, 2005, I'm not sure of the dates, and it was another agent's case, and I assisted them on doing surveillance and, and tracking the stuff once it was illegally brought into the country, and we had caught some, our inspectors found ivory hidden in uh, furniture. And when you see the x-rays of it, you can see the ivory tusks in the back of a chair and, and they were taking pieces of ivory, rings of ivory and, and putting beading um, work around it so it looked like jewelry, it looked like beaded jewelry, um, but it was actually ivory underneath it. So we 
we did surveil some of the imports and then catch the people who were smuggling into the country. This is comes down to, in my opinion, and this is not the opinion of the service, this is my opinion, is that the only way you will ever, ever stop illegal ivory trade or illegal wildlife trade of any kind is to stop the demand. So you can have all the laws in the world, and that's the problem with creating all these laws and bans, is then that creates another enforcement level where we have to, the enforcement officers, the agents and inspectors who are trying to enforce it have to figure out to tell, have to, have to try to figure out how to stop these things from coming in or to figure out what's already here that might have come in illegally before we caught it. And that's the tough thing around there. It, it really comes down to people analyzing what they do and how, what kind of an effect it's having everywhere yeah, else. But if the profit is better than the penalties, there's no reason for them to stop. And there's only one reason for them to stop poaching, if nobody wants the product. The change we see is often the work of established organizations. However, most of these organizations were started as a product of the vision and ambition of an individual. Well, the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust um, has been working for over 35 years to protect Africa and Kenya's wildlife. Um, it was founded um, in, in, in 1977, and it was founded because a gentleman called David Sheldrick, who was um, a warden in Kenya's National Park, Savo National Park, um, sadly passed away. Um, and throughout his life, his wife Daphne had worked alongside him to protect and conserve the wildlife in Kenya. And so when he died, um, the charity was set up in his name so that we could continue um, all the work that he started. So, so that sort of that was the origins of the charity, and since then, obviously, 35 years and more have passed, and we've branched out as a charity to do more and more because obviously the threats facing Kenya's wildlife um, continue to expand and, and sort of differentiate. So, whereas when we started, we were focused much on rescuing orphaned elephants and rhinos, which at the time might have been orphaned because of human wildlife conflict or poaching. Um, now we've got anti-poaching teams, so obviously there's, there's a huge threat from poaching at the moment. We've got mobile vet units, obviously, so we can treat any injured animal, especially obviously those animals that have been targeted by poachers. Um, we've got aerial surveillance. We work with communities so that they, they can be educated to understand the importance of their wildlife and why we, why we all need to work together to protect it. Um, and then we also work to save habitat. So, so we, were, we were founded sort of to, to respond to the threats facing wildlife back in the 70s, and since then, we've obviously grown and adapted to meet the threats facing wildlife today. As Savo's just come out of this dry season, our, our mobile victims were, were really, really busy um, treating poaching cases. We, we treated less elephants this year um, than we did last year throughout that period, which shows that obviously the work of our poaching teams is taking effect. We've got Skylat team, which is a fully mobile um, veterinary team um, that, that will fly into areas inaccessible by foot and those that our mobile vet teams can't get to. Um, and our anti-poaching teams, our mobile vet teams and our sky vet teams um, are, all, are all, all work in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service. Um, so last but not least, we've got um, community outreach work, so we work with communities. And we've also got a project called Saving Habitats because we realise obviously as human populations grow, um, the spaces in which animals, in, in which wild animals live, are, are increasingly being made smaller and smaller and smaller. So we need to do a lot to protect our habitats, to ensure that our wildlife, you know, in, in future years still has a home. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is what the David Children Wildlife Trust does. Just as these individuals took advantage of their inspiration to change the world for the better, the ability to make a meaningful difference is in your hands. There are many opportunities for the average person to stand up and help set the world in the right direction to stop poaching ivory. By thinking about one thing, every time you go to one country, look at products and try to buy something to come home. And, and they need to ask themselves this one question is, do I need it? Is it something that I need? Do I want it? Maybe. Do I need it? No. Right. No, everybody who's ever bought an ivy carving could survive without that ivy carving. It's not going to affect their living day to day. And so if you can get people to understand that and people to start promoting that through their friends and families, I don't need it. Even if it's legal, I don't want it. Even if it's a legal piece. Because even having a legal piece, what people don't understand is that when you have something that might have been legally acquired, the people who can't afford those will still try and find some other way 
to get it. So if you have it now and you legally have it, that's fine. But buying and selling it and trading it still promotes the illegal trade. So keep it if you have it. Uh, I don't think we should take things away from people who legally acquired them. That's fine. But I don't think we should encourage the trade in the items at all. That's my personal opinion. Because it just keeps promoting the demand. That, well, the animal that was killed for this was butchered and still alive with half of its face missing when somebody took it off. There's many different uh, avenues for people to get uh, involved in elephant con conservation. Um, uh, the, certainly, uh, any person that really wants to be involved in elephant conservation can go to their local zoo um, and not only experience uh, elephants at their local zoo, but talk to their local zoo about what they're doing and how they can help. We are always looking for funding for those projects. Um, when you work with a very large megavertebrate, um, usually uh, putting a researcher in the field is very expensive. Uh, and having them stay there a long time is even more expensive. Uh, if you really want to accomplish anything with elephant conservation, you need to have people in the field and they need to be on the ground working and watching what's going on to ensure uh, long-term viability for your conservation project. Anytime you can uh, stop uh, ivory being utilized for anything other than an elephant wearing it, you're ahead of the game. So, you know, it's up to the public. There are lots of ways um, the average person can help save, save the African elephant. People can campaign um, from, from their living room, which makes a huge difference for African elephants. From writing to your local politician, making them aware of what's going on in the world, and so that they can then they can then lobby on, on elephants' behalf, um, you know, in, in national parliament. That, that's really, really key. Um, it could be to write into your local newspaper to let journalists they know about the situation and let them know what we're doing or what other organisations are doing. We have a foster, foster scheme at the David Shodrick Wildlife Trust which enables people to make a small donation and then they can foster an elephant in our care and receive monthly updates. Obviously, as a charity, and lots of other organisations out there, um, we're dependent on, on donations. We don't receive any government funding. So obviously, if, if anyone was to donate to the charity, it means, or any other organisation, it means that they can do a lot more on the ground to support to support elephants. Join any campaigns that are out there. It could just be, you know, sharing news on, 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 on social media about elephants, about poaching, you know, and the positive stories too. So there are lots of different ways from, from being active online to being active letter writing to donating and, and supporting. Stop pushing ivory. And stop pushing ivory.